I want to welcome everyone to the third webinar sponsored by Creative Vitality Suite. We are pleased today to have two special guests, Sophia Klapsker, who is the head of Arts for LA, really one of our most dynamic advocacy organizations in the West and actually throughout the country, and Senator Ben Allen, who is the chair of the Joint Committee on the Arts in the state of California. I really want to, just before we turn to the, uh, these two guests, uh, to talk about uh, art and the use of data in political conversation. I want to talk a little bit about where we are. In, in webinar number one, we talked about how to use data and really focus on uh, how to appeal to different audiences using different messaging. And we really made the point that even though you have a lot of powerful data, please don't overwhelm your audience with endless sets of data. And then we also really underscore here at West Staff the need to use correct data. Uh, unfortunately, in the arts community over the years, we've had a not so good habit of using whatever data comes before us, but this can come back to bite us because as we look to develop trust with our elected officials, using data that is less than correct is never helpful, and they, I can tell you, do not appreciate it. Uh, webinar number two dealt with the principles of persuasion, and I won't go into that webinar findings too much because we want to get on with our, our guests, but I think what I want to emphasize with you more than anything is there really are principles of persuasive argumentation. There are theories of argumentation. So uh, we encourage arts advocates to look at those, and we have some of those again on our website that are summarized from the last webinar. Uh, I also want to at this time try to explode some myths about some of the data streams that are out there. Uh, the Creative Vitality Suite is a very robust data stream about creative economy. It includes data from the for-profit and the non-profit worlds. It can be downloaded by uh, zip code, county, MSA, state, uh, national, sub-regional, regional, all kinds of slicing and dicing of data, which makes it a very useful tool. And I would underscore uh, it is an interactive tool, so it's pretty fun to play with. We have other data streams that people use that are out there that are great, but they're different. For example, we have the National Endowment for the Arts Bureau of Economic Analysis satellite account. And this is a wonderful uh, study of the size of the creative economy across America. It's also available broken down by state, and that's about it. So uh, interesting streams of data, but again, compared to the CV suite, uh, a little bit more limited. Also, we have the Americans for the Arts Art and Economic Prosperity Study done once every five years uh, and based on surveys of about 300 and some uh, local sites imputed to the national uh, scene. So that's another uh, data source that's available. Again, not done like CB Suite quite so frequently and based on uh, a little less representative data than, uh, actually a lot less than the CB Suite has. So, uh, data sets out there are different. You can use them in different ways, and again, uh, we encourage you to use the ones that work best for you. Um, so that's all I really want to say about WestF and the CV Suite for now. Uh, I encourage you to go to our website and find Creative Vitality Suite uh, and look for a lot of resources. But I now want to turn to Sophia and ask her to introduce our special guest, Senator Ben Allen. Sophia? Thank you, Anthony. I, um, I'm so honored to be part of this, and I really appreciate you including our Trilly. And hello, Senator. Let me start actually by saying a few words about you. So California State Senator Ben Allen was elected in 2014 to represent the 26th Senate District, which consists of the West Side, Hollywood, and Coastal South Bay communities of LA County. I should also say that I live in Senator Allen's district, and I'm one of his constituents. Ben serves as chair of the Senate Education Committee and the Legislature's Joint Committee on the Arts. He is a member of the Senate Committees on Elections and Constitutional Amendments, Natural Resources and Water, and Transportation and Housing. He co-chairs the Environmental Caucus and is vice chair of the Jewish Caucus. The Joint Committee on the Arts was formed in 1984 and recognizes that the arts contribute significantly to the quality of life in California, play an important role in the identity, innovation, and economy of the state. And setting dramatic, 
decline in arts education programs in the state's public schools, the core areas of the committee is authorized and directed to study include the economic impact of the arts in California, the budget and programs of the California Arts Council, goals appropriate to the future of the arts and culture life of California, arts legislation in the state, and the status of arts education in California. As chair of the Joint Committee of the Arts, Senator Allen authored successful legislation that reinstated teaching credentials for theater and dance educators. And I have to say, as someone who worked in arts education and arts education reform for over a decade, um, this is a significant, major, remarkable achievement. He is fighting for increased access to the arts in schools, especially in disadvantaged communities, and is working to keep entertainment industry jobs in California. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard University, where he graduated magna cum laude in history, a Master of Philosophy degree from the University of Cambridge, and a Juris Doctorate from UC Berkeley. He is also fluent in Spanish. So Senator Allen and I have worked together in a few different ways over the years. Within the first month of my uh, being the Executive Director of Arts for LA, Senator Allen had introduced a resolution to increase state arts spending, and, and uh, funding, not just spending, <laughs> funding. And this is introduced, I started April 1st, it was introduced April 7th, and it was the first campaign that my organization supported for Allen. Um, then two weeks later, there was the hearing of the Arts and Creative Industries and updated assessment of California's creative economy on April 15th. And um, not only was it standing room only, I was also honored to be the one to present from Californians for the Arts, Senator Allen with the Arts Champions Award because of his support for increasing support for California Arts Council. Senator Allen is a true friend to the arts and the son of a working artist. He has also instantly become one of the state legislature's strongest arts champions. Um, I would say that today's discussion, we're going to revolve around our efforts in the arts and how the Senator and I have worked together, but also how most of this audience of arts administrators listening today can navigate the political landscape to advocate for their cause in a meaningful way to produce results. So hello, Senator. It's really nice to speak to you today. Can you talk a little bit about your involvement in the arts and the recent oversight hearing of the Joint Committee, specifically your work with Artists Live Workspace, and policy considerations and building community support and connections. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to folks who are out there advocating for the arts. Uh, I, as was mentioned, I'm the son of a working artist and grew up with the arts in a very strong place in my in my household. And uh, so it was a it was something very special and close to me growing up. Uh, but then as I got more and more engaged in public policy, particularly in the world of education, I served on the school board in Santa Monica, Malibu uh, for six years before my election to the Senate. And uh, previous to that, I was, when I was at law school, I was a student member of the Board of Regents at the University of California. And now I serve as the Education uh, Committee Chair. Uh, you know, it's become so abundantly clear to me uh, uh, about uh, you know, what, what an important role the arts can and should be playing in terms of addressing the achievement gap and reaching out to students who might be really disconnected from the traditional academic curriculum. And so it's a, it's a, it's a part of my blood. Uh, I, I grew up in a school district that really valued the arts, and so I think it was just a, kind of a no-brainer for me. It was just part of, such a strong part of the culture in my own home community. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's part, of what, part of what brings me to this, to this role. Uh, we did just have a hearing. The, the, the Arts Committee was looking at a number of different issues, but one of the things that we looked at was this whole question of artists live workspaces and the extent to which we need to really be thinking a big picture about the role that incre ever increasing costs, cost of living, housing costs, transportation costs, uh, the impact that that's having on our creative economy and on our artists. Uh, we, of course, looked at you know, the issue of the ghost ship fire incident, that terrible tragedy that, you know, put us in a place where we really have to act. I think it was a story both of, uh, you know, some of the traditional issues of lack of oversight and, and, um, and compliance and fire safety, but there was also a real story there about costs and about the fact that, you know, artists are increasingly turning to makeshift situations just to be able to live and work and, and you know, do their, do their, uh, uh, do their work. And, um, you know, I don't think anyone ever wants to be in a non-fire compliant building, but um, but a lot of artists were sort of driven to that situation. And I, I think I worry about the extent to which uh, there are artists all over the state who are 
in unsafe situations. And then, of course, the question is, you know, how do we, instead, you know, the answer is not to just shut down these, these institutions. The answer is to figure out a way to, to help artists do their work in a, in a safer way. There's so many different issues at play right now, uh, and, and I think it's really going to take the engagement of government officials, artists, others in the community, developers, property owners. Uh, we, we heard from, uh, from, a, from a gentleman in Oakland who's an artist and a building owner who's been trying to do the right thing and upgrade his building, but he's finding that the permitting costs have been prohibitive. Uh, we need to support folks uh, like him you know, trying to, to get into compliance. Um, of course, there's also the issue of gentrification in neighborhoods all over our state. It's impacting artists along with others in our communities. And, you know, we, we heard from uh, some folks in East L.A. who have been working on that issue, trying to bridge the gap between traditional communities and, and, uh, and artists who have been helping to revitalize neighborhoods. But, you know, how do, how do we make sure that the artists can both how, – how do we make sure that there's a win-win where the artists can play a role in helping to revitalize the neighborhood while also – not leaving to many of the uh, traditional residents and neighbors feeling left behind. Uh, we also we heard a really cool story from a, a project in, in Sacramento, Warehouse Artists Lost. Uh, the developer of the project was able to tap into various sources of financing that made it possible to build this project. It was a combination of low-income housing tax credit, uh, opportunities, a, a loan. There was a capital area development authority loans. The state of California had some Prop 1C funds. There was a historic tax credit equity to help with the, you know, the revitalization of a, tr of a of historic building, and then there was a deferred developer fee too. And they've been able to create this very vibrant space uh, that has been good both on the on the neighborhood revitalization side and also on the retail side that, that was successful because they engaged local artists early and often in the development process and created a, a variety of community spaces for interaction and performance and also a wide range of affordability. So there was low mixed income um, and, then, and then market rate um, uh, availability in the, in the housing. Um, so it was a, it's, it's, there, there's a lot to be done. There's a lot to learn about. But um, you know, ultimately, government does have an important role to play, coordinating with artists and other folks from our creative economy to help to create the spaces where artists can really grow and thrive. And, but we just need to be really sensitive to the sorts of concerns that artists have. And uh, part of, I guess, and of course artists need to know how to effectively advocate you know, before government, and that's part of why we're having this webinar today. Exactly. And, and I think what's significant about what you just said is also embedding the artists early on made for a successful project as well as some solutions to these kinds of issues. Um, and so that's something that we try to, to, to promote, and I, I, we would recommend that other administrators promote as well, is how can you have your community be more invested in civic dialogue or planning earlier in a, in a project? Um, you also just reviewed the newly released economic data from the Otis report on the creative economy. Can you talk a little bit about that report and its recent findings? Yeah. So since its inception in 2007, the Otis College of Art and Design, which is in my district, uh, not too far from LA International Airport, uh, Otis has commissioned the LA County Economic Development Corporation to generate the Otis Report on the Creative Economy. And uh, this was done to focus specifically on Los Angeles County. Uh, but then four years ago, the report was dramatically enhanced to measure data and, and, and also to analyze trends throughout the entire state. So you know, go beyond just LA and Orange counties, but, but look, look throughout the state. And that's obviously something that our committee really welcomed because you know, we've been really looking to try to expand uh, the conversation to uh, areas of the state that have sometimes been left off, the, left off the map, left off the radar screen when it comes to the creative economy. And so uh, what's, what's great about this report is that it gives us, on an annual basis, an opportunity to review quantifiable data. Every single year we can look at trends, we can see the impact that the creative economy is having on the state and the role that government can play in helping to grow that, that economy. Uh, a couple of key findings from the 2017 report, our creative economy, the total creative economy output for the state totals more than $400 billion. Uh, I think it's $406.5 billion in both direct, indirect, and induced uh, economic generation. Uh, that, that, that translates to 1.6 million jobs all over the state and uh, $136 billion in total labor income. And we're way ahead of any other state in the country uh, in terms of creative economy jobs. 
And, um, you know, there's a lot of taxes and tax generation that comes out of this. The, the estimate is that it's, some, it's almost you know, something about $16.7 billion worth of property sales and um, local and state personal income taxes, uh, et cetera, that are both directly and indirectly generated by the creative industries. And a couple of things we learned, the, the largest of the creative industries as, as, a ma as measured by, by, by jobs, at least, by job counts, is uh, entertainment is number one, followed by publishing and printing, followed by fashion. Uh, these three industries accounted for 60% of the direct creative industries employment in California, but ultimately there are so many different industries uh, that, that have a d you know, deep direct connection to, to creativity and, and the creative economy, and, and um, we're looking at all of them. We've looked at the question of galleries, we've looked at the question of working artists, we've looked at, um, at muralists and designers and architects, and there's, there's so many aspects of this, it's, it, and ultimately it's such an important part of what makes California so great. I mean, if you look at how we've gotten to the place where we're now the sixth largest economy in the world, almost the fifth, our, this, this creative mix that we've been able to foment here in the state is such an important part of that. Mm -hmm. And what we found... Well, one, uh, one thing to mention, by the way, also that the, okay. the creative economy uh, occupations often require higher levels of education or skills training, about 50% of those examined requiring a bachelor's degree or higher, and that, that also ties into some of the work we're doing at the, at the Education Committee to try to, to help get more young people through, through college. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think we want to focus on getting more young people through college, and we also want to point out that when 50% of those jobs do demand the higher degree, that also means 50% don't. And for the first time, we can really make that claim that for people exiting high school, if college isn't on their path, the creative economy is a really good career path for them, and there are opportunities there that we can expand on and grow as well. So Absolutely. I think we, following both pathways is really important for the state. Um, I also love you talking about quantifiable data, about the impact. I have to say, when the Otis Report first came out, just in terms of its impact on LA County and the Southern California region, that really was a game changer for us on how we could use that quantifiable data, and then use it to have other research developed and created and kind of bounce back and forth. So um, that, that's really, it's, it's terrific to hear how it's happened that the state now is looking in this way and that we have these real numbers. Um, I have, my next question actually is about going federal. So what have you heard from your arts communities and organizations about this potential NEA cut? And how loud are these organizations being on the subject and how organized are their efforts, in your opinion? Well, I've heard from a number of arts organizations and members of the arts communities around the state about this. This is obviously something that's raising a lot of concerns. Um, but I will say, in addition to the, the kind of usual suspects, the folks that you would expect to, uh, to, to raise concerns, I've actually been, been um, I, I, I found striking the number of Californians around the state and California business leaders, such as the Boeing Corporation, you know, folks who are not arts organizations or part of, the, of traditional arts communities who are also deeply concerned about cuts to the NEA, because I think they see, you know, what, they, they see how important the arts are, uh, broadly speaking, to our economy and to creativity and to keeping, Calif you know, keeping California and the nation competitive and innovative and, and this, this Keeping part, the key part of what's made, made, made us so successful over, over the past few decades. Uh, by the way, I'd like to add that it's not only the NEA, but it's four of our iconic natural cultural agencies that are on the chopping block. The, there is the NEA, but there's also the National Endowment for the Humanities. There's the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and then, of course, the Corporation for Public, for Public Broadcasting that funds PBS and NPR. Uh, the President has proposed eliminating all four of these pillar national cultural agencies. Uh, so, you know, we need to push back hard. Uh, certainly folks have been raising concerns, but we need to do it loudly. Uh, there was a, a National Americans for the Arts Advocacy Day that happened this year on March 21st in, in D.C. I, I know that that was effective. Uh, a lot of folks went and met with many members of Congress. They were able to remind them of the value of minimally maintaining the modest funding that these organizations receive. Uh, and, and ultimately, not only did Congress maintain their budgets, but they, they actually proposed slight increases. So I think that it was, it was nice to see that, that you know, the, the, the president's 
destructive call actually generated a lot of pushback, and, and Congress felt that pushback, and, 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 and that was reflected by the, by the ultimate um, result. But, but you know, this issue is not going away. We're going to have to be very vigilant on, on this issue. Uh, the fact of the matter is we are so far behind other countries. I, I, I met with, uh, I met with a, you know, the, the, the heritage minister from Canada uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was just extraordinary how much more money than, that they spend on the arts in their country versus us. It, it, and it just, it, it's embarrassing. I, you know, most countries that are, that are our, our sort of competitor countries are, are just so much more committed to to public arts funding, uh, the NEA is an absolute drop in the bucket, and it's just shameful that the president has put it on the chopping block. And I think I think in the state as well that we've we've seen that money coming into California and how it can be leveraged, but our state funding is so low compared to the rest of the country, and then when you compare it to other countries as well, um, that it it really feels very daunting. Um, the other thing that we found here is that. We decided as a local advocacy organization to support the statewide and federal campaigns. And so in uh, partnership with California for the Arts, which is a board I sit on, we created, we used our actual our online platform and collected over 6,000 signatures of Californians who then those signatures were delivered by hand in March to the DC representative. Because we really thought this is important not to just show who, um, that we are a country that supports this, but that this is a state where this is a priority. Um, and we also on our website have a toolkit on how to kind of put these kinds of petitions together and what that looks like. Um, so it's something that we've been trying to foster a little bit more. Have, have you been impressed by the messaging or presentation when these organizations come to you support for the arts? Or what advice do you have for the arts? in general when they're advocating to you? Yeah, I have. I've, I've certainly been impressed. Um, and I will say that California to the Arts and Arts for LA have been very effective in outreach and messaging. They've, um, they've, they've got a lot of experience, both organizations, with you know, meeting with legislators, developing relationships, effectively making their case. Uh, but it, it is an, uh, it's an absolute you know, never-ending process, and, and folks who care about this kind of thing need to continue to, 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 to push, push, push. Um, what are some things? So, so I, I've certainly been impressed, but I, I think part of what you have to do is craft the message and tailor it to the to, to the to the member of the legislator, to the person you're trying to convince. You also have to know your message. You have to have a specific goal in mind. Uh, both the best outcome and then also keeping in mind that compromises may be part of the process. You're never going to get everything you really want, but um, understanding that, that, you know, that, that understanding how to recognize a win uh, when, when, when you see it. Um, a couple of things that I would, I would spend some time doing. First of all, get to know the person you're, you're meeting. Make sure you've read their biography beforehand. Make sure you understand what are the things that they care about, what are the things that they focus on. Uh, if you can bring someone with you, a member of your organization who's actually from the legislator's district, for example, that's very effective. You know, ultimately, as much as we know and love the statewide advocates, we don't. We our, our own our, our real accountability is to our voters. And so, if there's someone from the district, particularly a prominent person, maybe even a local elected official, you know, someone who's or someone on the arts commission, or you know. A, City council member, or um, or just you know a local leader who cares a lot about the arts and the business community, uh, who can come and be part of that advocacy trip. That that's really meaningful because there's just another level of accountability when it's someone who they know the legislator knows that they're going to see back home at the you know the fish fry or the you know whatever local event that they're going to on a regular basis. Um, I would I would I would sort of be both informed and able to speak about the contributions that your organization or the arts writ large make both to the state as a whole, but also have talking points about local impacts. And that, that could include both data and, uh, and also uh, anecdotes, local stories that, that make a difference. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. We are, we are storytellers as people. You know, human beings are, are storytellers. And as much data as you want to throw at somebody, the, sometimes what most impacts someone is, is that personal touch, that personal story that um, you know that, that, that may tell a, a thousand 
a thousand data points uh, right in one story. I'll give you I'll give you a little example. There was a fundraising pitch one time from an organization that was working on on uh, on child soldiers. They were trying to help they were trying to help uh, help child soldiers get transition back into into civilian life in Africa. And they sent out one fundraising pitch that talked about the fact that there were you know, near over a million child soldiers in Africa and it's such a big problem. Please help us. We're doing all this great work. And we've saved so many you know, hundreds, you know, thousands of lives. And it got a certain amount of money, but not that much. They were actually kind of disappointed by how effective the, the fundraising pitch had been. They then sent a, a letter out just telling the story of one child soldier. And their fundraising went through the roof. <laughs> And then the next time they, they sent a letter, it was the story of two child soldiers, and that was lower than the one child soldier. So the, the, re, the reason I bring all this up is that, uh, you know, we, we, we were raised in the caves listening to stories. You know, we are, we are inclined towards stories, and data can sometimes be a little overwhelming, and certainly, you know, legislators care a lot about data, probably more than the average show, just because we have to be looking statewide uh, on the policy implications of everything we decide all the time. But... But having some of those meaningful stories, bringing someone who, you know, from their district whose life has been transformed or touched by their interaction with the arts, that, that kind of thing can be so powerful. Um, you know, uh, I'll give you know, another example. I, we went, I, I got a chance to bring a Republican colleague to a, 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 a prison where Tim Robbins' organization, Actors Gang, was doing a – a session with a bunch of, of young women. They were um, this was a, a juvenile you know, detention facility, and they, as part of the program, got up there and were able to do some acting games. But they also had a kind of a TED Talk portion where they got up and they told their their stories, and it was just so moving and so powerful. Uh, this colleague of mine was in tears by the end. It just it just hit him in such a hard, you know, tangible way. And really packed a punch, and it was just so hard to, you know, to deny the, the humanity and, and, the, and the extent to which this program had touched these young women who had you know, lost their way and made some mistakes. But oftentimes, those mistakes were couched in their own experiences and, and traumas that they had suffered themselves. And it, there, it just it just touched him in such a human way, and it really struck me. Uh, so there's no question. Make sure to have data, right? Make sure to have specific facts and accomplishments. You want to be able to talk about you know how many kids you're helping to have a place to create after school. Um, you know, keep away from potential trouble. You want to be able to talk about the number of people you employ and how much they live and you know how much they spend in the community and the impact. But but in addition, those those stories, uh, particularly if they can be delivered by someone who's experienced them personally, uh, can also pack a real punch. Oh, God, I love that. And uh, obviously, that's a program that that's near and dear to my heart. Um, Dr. Ging is an LA organization with national impact in how they're they're working in prisons. I think what's notable is you need to have that data, but also that you took someone with you out into the field for that uh, in-person experience. That's invaluable. And now you're the anecdote story inside the legislator, like legislature. And I think that we as advocates need to remember that we're sharing stories with you but you also need an opportunity to experience those events so that you can share them with your colleagues um, as well. The, so many people don't know that I actually started my career in technology as well as in the fine arts, but really um, technology is my background. And I think you've talked about this being present, bringing data, know who you are, know who's coming in. But can you also talk a little bit about technology and how uh, data in the arts can be available, we, how we're using it. How important is data in the conversation, um, especially when we look at things like cuts to the NEA? I, I mean, look, ultimately data is a vital part of the conversation. Maybe, maybe not for the President of the United States, but uh, certainly for, <laughs> for, for, for you know, state legislators here in California, we care a lot about data. We understand that ultimately every decision we make has implications, and if we're not taking data into account, we have to – and we're making a real mistake. Um, you know, understanding the con contributions of arts organizations to the economy, their collective worth definitely helps to validate policy decisions. Um, you know, there's a lot of different competing um, mouths at the trough here in Sacramento, and if, if folks are not, uh, you know, if, if ultimately they're all they're all coming. Every other organization, every other group, every other cause is coming with you know, packed with data and, and explaining how you know their tax cut or their incentive or their public investment is going to pay off 
royally for the, for the state. And, and we need to do similar work on our side because otherwise uh, we're, you know, we're not making the stronger case uh, compared to some of those other groups. Um, so I think one of the things is the number of jobs associated with creative workers and employers that resonates with both sides of the aisle, something everyone cares about and, and you know, something that we need to, to kind of always think about. We're, there's, legislators are very concerned about jobs. They're very concerned about, about economic competitiveness and talking about real jobs, real lives that, impact, that have been impacted and the, the number of jobs, the amount of, of, of economic you know, activity generated by those jobs and the tax revenue generated is also, also great. Uh, so those are, I, I, think, I, think, I think the data is super important. The data is super important, and particularly for the arts, which is sometimes seen as this feel-good thing. Um, but I do think, you know, what I say, it's all, I, I really think that the advocacy always has to have a little bit of both. It's got to have a little bit of, of, of data and then a little bit of, um, a little bit of emotional impact. And, 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 and there's nothing like having the story of someone who's been impacted by the arts told directly from the horse's mouth, not just by someone who makes a living as an advocate, but someone whose life has been changed uh, because, by one of these programs. Uh, and I'm, you, you set this up really perfectly because I want to get a little bit wonkier around the data for a second. Um, that Anthony spoke at the very top about the different types of data available in the arts. Um, and I guess the question is, do elected officials distinguish between advocacy-oriented data, data that was derived from surveys, or more scientific research-level data? And from where you're sitting, how important is the accuracy? And I, I think accuracy obviously is subjective, but also we mean it in a very literal way here, the, but the accuracy of that data. Yeah, well don't, don't take your cues from the President of the United States. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we need, it, it, is, it, is, it is important to be accurate. There, there's no question about it. I mean, uh, legislators have to deal with facts every day and have to deal with they have to make the, they have to feel comfortable making decisions based on on facts that they can rely on that they can depend on uh, so you know no question about about you know, your 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 uh, integrity and um, and and credibility is at stake every time you come to meet with a legislator and if you flub the facts if you don't provide good backup a, leg a legislator will not trust you the next time you come back to talk to them, and you're going to have to come back and talk to them again in the future. We bring up surveys. I think they are they are they are useful. You know, uh, uh, they they can help you know to to let us understand where where priorities lie, allow us to drill down on specific problems or challenges either within the arts advocates area focus or or also to find out you know how broader community needs uh, might better serve. Um, so I would I would say if you've got both surveys and research level data, you really you know, that, that's that's a good combination of, of 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 scientific data to present to a to a to a legislator. Great, and I, I think you um, I appreciate you making some distinctions, and also that we sometimes assume that the arts world isn't as detailed and research specific, but there are a lot of people who have that skill. Even with that, what data do you find most trustworthy? Do you, is it university research centers, paid consultants, local advocacy groups? Is there a distinction in your mind when you hear different sources? Absolutely. I mean, we, we, are, we are presented data that conflicts every single day. You have to understand, we're, we're, we're voting on bills every day that oftentimes generate strong support or opposition from highly paid lobbyists and consultants. Maybe it's a battle between labor versus the business community. And both sides will come in with great data explaining why their perspective is absolutely correct and the other side is, is absolutely incorrect. And, you know, so we're, we're used to being spun, but we're also, as a result, used to having to, to, to develop a, a thick skin and a certain healthy skepticism when it comes to, to, to data, right? Because everyone, everyone, everyone uses data in, in, you know, to their to their uh, 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 to advance their own cause, and by the way, it, that doesn't mean you, you shouldn't have data. You need data because you know you, you got to ultimately compete with everybody else. But understand that we're also 
constantly uh, hearing from different groups that present conflicting data. And that can be both frustrating and challenging and, and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a puzzle sort of way, exciting for, for those legislators who really want to delve in deep and try to get to know exactly what the problem is and then make a wise decision. So I would say, um, yes, a, a university research center is, is oftentimes very uh, a, good, a good place to go but, uh, for, for data, though, though certainly um, you, you want that person to be as credible a source as possible. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that there are certain university research centers that are known to have a particular line or particular take on, a, on an area of policy. Um, I know that I'm likely to get a very different kind of report about an economic question from the UCLA Labor Center as I would from the economics department at the, you know, at the Hoover Institution at, at Stanford. I mean, they're just, you know, when I get something from Hoover, I'm assuming it's going to be a little more likely to be conservative. When I'm getting something from the Labor Center at UCLA, it's going to be a little bit more to the left and a little more pro-labor. Um, so I take that all with a grain of salt when I get that, that kind of information. I think ultimately, you know, you want to have independent sourcing of, of data and information, so some kind of national source or some sort of, uh, you know, the U.S. Census or the National Center for Charitable Statistics. You know, there, there's, 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 there, there are some very credible sources that I think are, um, that, 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 that are respected by everybody regardless of their political perspective or persuasion. You touched briefly on this idea of how to communicate and the stories that we tell, but I'm wondering if there's a, when you look at the best mode of being communicated to, what is the best way to reach you, and how important is social media in advocating for the arts? I think social media has become a very important form of communication. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a great way to organize and engage supporters and members. It's a way to quickly communicate with a, with a legislator. I, you know, I would, I would certainly, and I went with their staff. Um, I would very much remember to be respectful and thoughtful. <laughs> There's a lot of people on social media who forget, you know, basic civility from time to time, and that doesn't always reflect well on them or their cause. And I've certainly heard cases of very good causes that have, that have generated uh, animosity or opposition from members because one person who espouses the cause has been insulting or rude or, uh, and, and ultimately, um, you know, really hurt a lot of very respectful, thoughtful advocacy by the vast majority of those advocates who push, who are pushing for the cause. Um, so that, that certainly is something to keep in mind. Remember, um, you know, I, I'd say send emails, send letters, make phone calls. Uh, understand that a meeting with a staff member is, is you know, oftentimes a very, it, it, it's a very good thing to do. Uh, you know, the, the, everyone wants to come up to the Capitol and meet with the legislator and, and you know, that's always really great if you can meet directly with the legislator, but the, but the legislators rely a lot on, on their high-quality staff to do so much of the, of the work. And so it's not, you know, it, it's not a, a, you know, some big insult to be meeting with the staff. The staff uh, really do help the legislator um, advocate and think and, and formulate their positions on things. So don't pass up an opportunity to meet with the staff if you're offered that as well. Uh, but certainly, if you're given an opportunity to meet with a member, come in really prepared, be ready to tell good stories. Um, I, would, I would also make a point of inviting elected officials to your events. If there is a gala dinner, if there is a presser, if there is a, an opening, um, have that elected official come. Take photographs with them. You know, send out tweets about it. Make them feel like they're part of your community. You know, send out a, get, you know, get a little article in the local press. That's all ways of, of building a relationship with that elected official and also connecting your organization to them so they're going to feel a little bit, <laughs> they'll oftentimes feel a little bit better about, uh, more likely to support you or feel a little more guilty if they don't uh, mm -hmm. because now all of a sudden you brought them into their family and, uh, and made them a part of, of, um, of, your, of, your, of your efforts. And, uh, and, you know, they appreciate it too because it gives them an opportunity to get in front of more constituents and, you know, get, you know, open up a whole new area of their district to them that they can connect with and, and, and get to engage with. And by the way, every time they're showing up at one of your events, they're, they're surrounded by your supporters who are talking to them about the importance of the arts. You know, um, a lot of organizations will give out uh, Legislator of the Year awards and those kinds of things. And I think that's, that's done both as a way of recognizing the legislator for their work and their leadership, but it's also a way to build relationships and make sure that, that, the, um, that the issues that the organization cares about are on the, on the legislator's radar screen as well. Um, definitely, uh, you know, come to hearings. Uh, go, go to the state capitol. Go to Washington, D.C. Uh, I, I, I know that legislators look at social media. 
you know, it is sometimes it's difficult for them to know which form of social media legislator most most utilizes. I mean, some some members are constantly checking their Twitter feed. Some never look at them at all. Um, some some read every single email that comes into their office. Some never look at the emails, and they just kind of get disseminated through. Uh, the staff or, or through you know a database and, and they end up being kind of ticks on a on a on a screen. So it's it's hard. I, I think actually it is one thing to you know as, as you are working hard to build relationships with legislators and with their staff, that is something to ask. You know, hey, what's the best way to reach you? What's the, what's the best way to be in touch? You know, do, does your member, does your legislator like to read articles? Do they like to come to events? Do they like to tweet? You know, do they like to um, do Facebook messages. Uh, you know, what, 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 what is the most, what's the best way to communicate to, to the member? When you receive data, do you prefer, do your, and I know, I know that you can't speak on behalf of all legislators, but do you have a sense of like pure data visualizations, visualizations with backup data, dense data detail uh, with an executive summary, or some other means? What, what format for you is going to be read and understood? So once again, every legislator is going to be different. Um, I think that having, uh, I think that, that that different people learn differently, right? There are visual learners, there are written learners, there are oral learners. Um, so coming with lots of different uh, uh, types of information, styles of information is super important. I find it very, you know, I want to have some written material in front of me. I want to be able to look at something, read it. Um, you know, that's part of how I learn. I, I certainly like visuals, too. Maybe it's growing up with an artist. I think artists are obviously very good at visual side stuff, um, but, but also having some really good written material that's detailed-oriented and, and, and factual can be really important, too. That's the kind of thing that, you know, if, if, I've, if, I've, if my mind has wandered a little bit in the context of a conversation um, and, and maybe I missed a key fact that someone is describing to me, if I have that fact right there in front of me in the paper, I, I, can't, I, I, don't, I don't miss a beat. And I can I can I can refer to the paper and I can internalize what's on the paper. Now some people don't want to read, right? Some people just want to have a conversation. Some people just want to look at charts. So the more you can, uh, the more the, the more different means you can uh, media you can you can bring to a conversation, and let the legislator and kind of focus or the staffer focus on the on, on the kinds of things that they find most useful, uh, the better. So um, you know I I. Uh, I think sometimes it also depends on 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 what uh, on what the context is and what I'm using the information for. If you're trying to convince me, that's one thing. Versus if I'm if you're trying to help me get some information that I want to disseminate to others. Uh, but I, I would I always it's always useful to have written written information uh, you know, information I can forward. Um, I can have someone follow up on something. Written information can be immediately transferred in a very f effective and efficient way and not have to be repeated and you know, change through the lens of a, of a conversation. It's good to have the report because it shows you got, you got backup, but having a strong executive summary that people can read quickly and disseminate quickly is also super important. And, you know, the, the whole point of advocacy in many cases is to um, have a legislator vote the way you want them to or to make sure that they're informed and briefed on what's important to you. If a politician has a stance on something, how likely is it that we can, that an advocate can change their mind? And what methods do they use to do this effectively? That's a good question. Um, well, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, so so uh, there's so many different ways to answer this question. I, I, okay, first of all, there, there, are situ there are times when there's a lot of momentum. You know, when 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 the whole state of the country is kind of pushing in a direction. I mean, there's certainly examples of you know the, the march to war. Sometimes people who might have been skeptical, but then everyone kind of gets all wrapped up in the, in the march to war. And so, you know, heads turn, minds change. Uh, there there can be similar movements in that direction toward particular policy goals or changes, and such as when you know Britain decided to somehow they they they, they found this moment where they could push through a national health service. Um, or, or there, you know, Lyndon Johnson famously kind of seized the moment in, in the 60s when the conditions were right to push all these great society reforms. Or, you know, you know FDR similarly when he was, um, you know, when when uh, uh, when he was pushing the New Deal reforms. Um, you know, sometimes what happens is people don't want to be caught on the, the wrong side of the issue. Um, you know, so. 
uh, sometimes that momentum will give them the support they need to take a stand in support. Um, now, you know, I think so. There, there's some of these moments, sometimes these historical moments, when 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 momentum exists that, that push hard in one particular direction. But I, I think for the vast majority of issues, particularly when you know the kinds of issues that arts advocates are oftentimes advocating for, you know, a little funding here and incentive there. Um, I think it comes back to some of the stuff that we were talking about before. It's, it's, it's building relationships. It's finding a place where you can meaningfully connect and build a conversation. Uh, matching advocates that are more, you know, that are relatable to the, to the legislator. Uh, someone from the district, you know, sets up a meeting, a moment that touches them. Um, you know, presenting background and data on the issue that's professional and reputable. Uh, sharing stories. You know, connecting to someone who, 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 who who's close to them. Um, one of the you know one of the, the legislators who jumped up and you know the Republicans that I mentioned who got very excited about supporting my theater and dance teaching credential bill did so because I think his mom had been a dancer and his and his sister had grown up in dance so he he was just close to that world and and it touched him in a way that was very visceral and deep and 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 and, and poignant. Um, so there there are, there are there, I have seen nearly every member of the legislature uh, change their mind one time or another in ways that I had not expected. Now that doesn't mean that you know that um, that, that that most Republicans are suddenly voting for tax increases in California, and most Democrats are voting to you know to repeal every piece of environmental legislation or labor legislation. But at the same time. Uh, I have seen I've seen almost every one of my colleagues vote in a, in a slightly unpredictable way once or twice because someone reached out to them and touched them or some argument connected with them. It could have been a personal relationship that existed either from member to member, a Democrat, Republican, or or a personal relationship that, that existed um, within their own family. One time I was told by a member of the legislature I was pushing for a particular bill, and he said, hey, man, you know, my son-in-law just hates this bill so much, and I'm just never going to hear the end of it at our dinner table conversations whenever I go over there. And so I, I hope you appreciate it. I hope you don't mind if I don't vote for it. So, you know, it, however you can connect, it, it really, you know, it, it's amazing. And I will say there have been times when I've been in committee where I've heard an argument where it, it swayed me. I, I, most of my colleagues have told me the same. It, it, you know, someone brings up an argument. Someone brings up a point that they, they maybe not hadn't anticipated. Um, and and that all can that all can make a difference. Um, what's tantalizing about it is that sometimes you work so hard and you still don't persuade the person because there's some other issue or there's some other factor. Uh, ideally, that legislator can be honest with you and open with you. Look, look, I'm never going to get there. I've got these issues, or you know, this this bill is going to impact this problem, you know, this issue in my district in a way that I think is just negative. We're never going to get our, you know, we're never going to be able to get it resolved. But. Um, it's part of what makes advocacy both so kind of exciting and frustrating all at once because sometimes decisions are made in ways that you don't even understand or can't quite get your head around. And sometimes we're told we have to vote a certain way even if we may not like a particular provision that you guys are concerned about because it'll just, if we don't vote for it, then the whole package will fail and other things that we care about will fail as well. And so that's part of what makes it so difficult. It's part of why your engagement early and often in the process can help to ward off those sorts of situations where you end up getting screwed because language gets into a uh, into a like a, a negotiated package that that um, that you that that, that 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 detrimental to you. So you need to have advocates and allies who are in the room paying attention and and, and protecting your interests uh, when when the negotiations get crazy. And that's that, that that's one of the most wild times of the legislative process is when you're finalizing the budget or when you're in the last couple um, days before the end of session, and just deals are getting struck left and right, and you've got to make sure that your your causes, your interests, your needs are being aren't being thrown under the bus. So, I, and I guess I, I'm going to just do a final on that because I think you you presented a, a few different ways that people are making decisions, but in the end, what wins the argument? Does data win the argument, or do emotions win the argument? I think you, you know it's it's both. I think I think you need both. They complement each other. I think uh, ignoring both, you you ignore both at your own peril. Yeah, I agree with that. I am so grateful that you are my legislator and that you've taken the time today to be part of this conversation. 
Well, it, it, listen, I appreciate the fact that there are folks out there advocating for the arts. I know what a difference the arts make in people's lives. And yet the, the challenge that we have is, is, is making sure that the arts get shoved onto the radar screen. Um, there, you know, we're never going to have the kind of money and advocacy and lobbying might of other organizations. What we do have is this extraordinary moral suasion, and we just need to make sure that we keep, we keep telling that story. Uh, You've got to support organizations that are, that are telling that story, that are advocating, uh, because they, they end up making such a difference. And we've got to redouble our efforts under the, all the, the current circumstances. And I just appreciate you, Sophia, and you know everyone at the Western States Arts Federation who are who are telling the story and pushing people to engage. The, the legislature, the Congress, it, it seems far away. It seems disconnecting at, at times. But but they're made up of people, and they're people who respond to constituents and hopes and fears and dreams of the society. And it's our responsibility as people who care about the arts to to push those hopes, fears, and dreams relating to the arts onto their radar screen. I want to thank uh, Senator Allen and Sophia Klatsker for today's program. Really wonderful insights and a lot of great sharing of information that's very useful. And before we close, I want to take a minute to share some of the takeaways. I have five that I just want to remind our audience of that I thought were especially useful from the two of you. Uh, one is to know your message and have a specific goal in mind uh, the Senator said repeatedly in different questions and answer times how, how really busy legislators are, how they're multitasking, and you better be focused as an advocate if you're going to make a difference. And I think his uh, painting of a picture of a, a day in the life of legislators is really important for us to remember. It's not like they have all morning and you're the only appointment. It's like there's a lot going on. I think we also learned about uh, we should know our organization's contribution to the economy. And we can find that through data. There are data sources. There are, there's the information we have about the number of people employed at our individual cultural organization. We know about uh, the number of people employed in creative economy in a county, uh, MSA, zip code. We can find all that. So that's important, important to know and, and to share. And then to use that data effectively. And as was pointed out several times, use the data in conjunction with storytelling. Very important and powerful combination. Uh, I think I heard the Senator say quite a few times, don't use one or the other exclusively, use both. That's great to be effective. We also heard some great comments on the power of social media and the importance of, of being effective in that arena. And I think of some of our people who are maybe older advocates who aren't as familiar with social media, but we heard today that social media can indeed be quite effective. We also uh, learned about inviting legislators to events. Uh, and I've been at a number of events where I thought, I just want to share this, legislators have been treated in a sensitive manner and others where maybe the legislators are asked to engage in an activity they're not quite prepared for. They might really not want to join the ballet dance on the stage. Uh, they might rather just talk. So think about how you're going to include a legislator in event that they do like to meet their constituents and learn something at events. And then finally, show up. Again, uh, Senator Allen mentioned joining campaigns, being present for hearings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, sometimes at some of these uh, public events, there just aren't a lot of people, and there is money on the table, and there are decisions being made. So we as arts advocates really need, need to show up. So those are a few takeaways from this informative conversation. Uh, I want to close now with a reminder for uh, the participants that you can uh, go to cbsuite.org and find all kinds of information about the Creative Vitality Suite, uh, information from our past two webinars. And uh, I also want to then turn to Sophia, who will manage the question portion of this for us. So Sophia, uh, let's start with the first question from one of our participants. Thank you all for joining us and for submitting questions. Uh, we did run a bit long, but we do have time for maybe two questions. Here's the first one we received. This webinar was helpful, but is there a resource out there where we can find information on how to advocate? Uh, any other best practices? And I would say Anthony just mentioned this, but on their own CV Suite site, they have information about the NEA that is 
the latest information. There also the weststaff.org site has a toolkit around advocacy. At a local level, Arts for LA, my website, does also have a toolkit. Uh, some of that information is how you work with elected officials, uh, how to host a meeting. And then again, nationally, we have Americans for the Arts. They have the Arts Mobilization Center and the Arts Action Fund, which the actions to be taken in a timely manner, as well as the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. They have an Advocacy 101, a Making the Case, and a Research section all around advocacy itself. For question two, here it goes. Uh, there are a few data-driven reports that are available to the arts, such as the newly released AC5, which we mentioned, which focuses on nonprofit contributions. Should we look more closely at the contributions of both to the for and nonprofit contributions? The answer, of course, is yes. Um, it's really important to talk about both for profit and nonprofit for a complete understanding of the economic value of the arts. We also need to include all classes of worker, not just full time equivalency, because with too narrow a focus, we often eliminate the contributions of the artist who generally does not clock in as a full-time worker, but instead the, uh, created a career out of, they tend to create a career out of various jobs, such as playing in an orchestra, teaching privately, and also working in a public school environment. Also, including the for-profit and non-profit shows a bigger, more realistic picture that is more accurate when speaking about arts impact. I know that locally, the Otis Report, we work with the LA Economic Development Corporation to develop the standards of what's happening in the private, the public, the nonprofit sectors, looking at the entirety. Sometimes your tourism offices have both the private and for, uh, private information as well as nonprofit. And of course, our host today, Westaf CBC TV Suite data tool allows the user to see both the for and nonprofit impact and see all classes of workers' contributions, that's salary jobs, self-employed, and extended proprietors, those who make the miscellaneous income. I will once again uh, say thank you to all who have joined today. Thank you to Senator Allen and to West staff. And this now concludes our webinar. Take care.